Well, hello everyone and welcome to the latest edition of Conversations with a Pro Trader. I'm your host, Greta Wall, and I'm joined today by T3 Trading Group professional trader, Patrick Haw. We do apologize for the, a bit of a delay. I was having some technical issues with my, my streaming software, but we are here and we are good to go. Uh, just a reminder for everyone who's been here before and if you're joining us uh, for the first time, this is a joint Q&A event. So the beginning half here will be a conversation between Patrick and I about the current market environment. And then the second half is a Q&A opportunity for the audience. So I'm going to put a comment in the chat right now and you can submit all of your questions for Patrick there. So go ahead and submit those as they come up. And then at the end, I will get to every single one of them. I'll make sure to ask him all of those questions. Uh, so we just wanna have them pile up over time so we can have a good section of those at the end. So hi, Patrick, thanks for joining us for this today. Of course, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, all right. So my first question, as you know, you've been here before, is give me a grade on your trading uh, this week so far on your typical grading scale, A to F. Yeah, sure. I would grade it um, honestly an A minus, which is pretty good. I'm probably never going to give myself an A plus because it can always be better. Um, but A minus is about as good as it could get for me. Um, so I had a pretty good week. Uh, it doesn't mean I didn't take any losses or anything like that. But, you know, I scaled in the way I wanted to scale into things. I managed my losses properly. I let winners run properly as they should. Um, and again, ma yeah, mainly just managing risk, taking, putting on risk where I should be putting it on, taking it off where I should take it off. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, just managing positions well. So pretty good. Um, again, not perfect. You can always be better. You can always have more size, this and that, but, um, yeah, I would say an A minus has been a pretty good week so far. That's good to hear. All right. So look, we'll get to the news of the day, kind of. We had focus back on the Fed in today's session with Chairman Jerome Powell beginning his two days of testimony in Congress, testifying in the House Financial Services Committee today for his, you know, semi-annual monetary report to Congress. So this is nothing, you know, scary. He wasn't subpoenaed to testify for them, anything, just something he does twice a year. Um, so today was day one. He reiterated what he said last week, that the process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go. So as a trader, what are your thoughts on the current situation with the Fed and the market? Yeah, so it's kind of more of the same of what we've been seeing with this market compared to the Fed, where mm -hmm. the Fed is saying one thing, the market is doing and pricing in something totally different. Mm -hmm. um, the main difference that we were seeing before, and I think it was the same last time I was on this, which was probably over a month ago at this point, mm -hmm. was the market's going up, up, up. The Fed is saying we need to fight inflation. We're not cutting rates. We're probably going to mm -hmm. keep raising rates. And the Fed futures market was pricing in multiple rate cuts throughout the end of the year, at which point we were saying there's not that there's no way that happens, but unless something really bad happens this summer, there's probably no way that's happening. Here we are now getting into summer. I guess summer's just starting. Feels like we're, you know, getting to halfway through or whatever. Um, now we're seeing those Fed funds unprice those cuts that are coming or kind of just push them back a bit. Um, mm -hmm. And we're actually pricing in another hike in July. However, the market is still, you know, we, we are just coming off a parabolic run, basically. NASDAQ got going parabolic. Then the S&P kind of caught up with that a bit. That was helped mm -hmm. by just broader strength, IWM, the Dow, stuff like that. Um, it's so it's a little bit different with how the Fed funds are pricing in coming cuts and everything like that. But you would think that pushing those coming cuts back would have hurt the market a little bit more. However, it's still this market where everyone's bearish and everyone thinks something is, you know, something bad's going to happen. We might retest those lows, whatever positioning is definitely not quite as bearish um, mm -hmm. positioning is getting filled up a little bit but you still have kind of this bearish sentiment especially with smart money maybe not so much uh, like momentum chasers and stuff like that but especially mm -hmm. with the smarter money the institutional side are still bearish so it's still this market where you know smart money is bearish people think something bad is going to happen the market doesn't break down max pain ends up being up things get pushed up but the fed saying the same thing we still need to bring inflation down our last inflation report was good but it's not mm -hmm. at two percent core right. cpi is still pretty sticky which is kind of what they're more focused on uh, as the core cpi and mm -hmm. it's still down but it's still i think the print was like 5.1 5.3 something like that 
Yeah. Um, so it's still this this interesting environment where the market's guessing one thing, the Fed is saying something else. And again, so far the Fed's been right. The Fed's been not right, but like sticking to what they're saying right. and not, you know, reversing and saying, oh, now we're going to cut rates. The market was right all along. Aha. It keeps being that the market's wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting environment. Um, it's kind of like a max pain is to the up while we just keep waiting for more data to roll in. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, and Fed officials have kind of emphasized multiple times that it's a much larger risk for them to not go far enough on inflation and then it become more sticky than it already is versus going too far, causing a recession and having to reverse. Would you agree with that sentiment? Yeah, for sure. And Powell specifically said that today mm -hmm. when he was talking about inflation immediately affects like lower income, um, which totally is accurate, right? Like if you have whatever you're making minimum wage or not a ton of money, your groceries go up, this and that, mm -hmm. that affects you immediately versus if you have a bit more money and you know, you, if you're lower income, you don't really own stocks in general, probably not a lot anyway. If mm -hmm. you are in the higher income bracket and you own stocks and okay, your groceries are going up, but so are your socks, it's all good. That's right. kind of like a delayed effect. It doesn't really hurt them quite as much. So Powell, uh, yeah, I totally agree with him. It, the inflation is hurting the lower class. We need, they need to correct it. It's better for them to cause a year of pain, two years of pain than mm -hmm. 10 years of just the wealth gap widening even more which is definitely something they don't want. And the Fed always gets blasted for the wealth gap. The Fed gets blasted for pretty much everything that they do, no matter what, yeah. whether it's right or wrong per se. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I totally agree with him. And I think he's doing the right thing so far. Um, you know, whether the market's right or wrong, we'll see. But um, yeah, yeah and I totally agree with him. And they definitely need to keep fighting inflation. Everyone notices their groceries. Everyone, you know, notices everything. I guess like gasoline is do. down a little yeah. bit. There's some things here or there that are fluctuating, but mm -hmm. others are definitely not coming down. And I don't see wages doubling overnight either. So it's definitely affecting people for sure. And they yeah. should stay on top of it. Yeah. The market fell today for what's now the third straight session. The recent rally seems to have lost steam at this point. Do you see this, though, as just, you know, a pause, kind of a correction or a true change in the trend? Yeah, so definitely a pause, which we as a team were looking for. Um, I think I'm still short a little bit, um, not as much as we were late last week, but we were looking for a pause. We were looking for a correction. This has been a parabolic market move. Mm -hmm. Again, it's kicked off really with the NASDAQ, I guess a couple of weeks ago at this point where I think last time I was on this, actually, we were still stuck in this sideways range. Yeah, we were in that range. Mm -hmm. That lasted about like a month and a half, two months. So we had a big breakup. You know, people were looking for it to break down. It didn't break down. It had a couple of false breakouts as well, which only added fuel to the fire of, you know, we get like a false breakout, shorts pile back in, and then we actually mm -hmm. break out. It's like double fire to the shorts. Um, so we have this big move, the cues go parabolic, um, a spy like kind of starts to break out and you know, what's left besides the cues moving up? Well, IWM, Dow, stocks, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So those moved up, but the cues then had another leg higher with that stuff moving up as well. So the mm -hmm. cues went parabolic, then they had like another leg higher that pushed the S and P to go parabolic Dow and Dow's back at resistance, IWM started a breakout and now is stalling a bit. Um, but so, yeah, it, it's a very healthy correction that I think we were due for. And I don't think is quite over yet. It definitely mm. could be though. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just on the back of the VIX. I talk about the VIX a lot because um, yeah, it's important to watch. And the VIX has just been pretty much going straight down for, I, want, I don't know, like a month now, at least, if not more, with really no upticks. There's been maybe one green candle here or there. Um, but, and I'm sure I'll talk about it a little bit later because I'm sure you have other questions regarding it. But the VIX is getting to levels of, I think it's 1325 today. That's pre bear market, that's pre COVID. And mm -hmm. pre COVID was Goldilocks, lowest unemployment, every, zero interest rates, everything was perfect. So you're getting these VIX levels that again are like pricing in basically no fear basically perfection 
And I would argue it's not a perfect environment out there. There's still tailwinds that could definitely come into this market. Mm. Um, yeah. So a healthy correction for sure. Whether or yeah. not it's over yet, we'll see. But um, yeah, it's it was a big parabolic move again. And that's like the key, the parabolic part. You usually yeah. don't just bounce right back up when the parabolic move breaks. It's very possible that this parabolic move didn't even break yet. We might still be in it. But once that mm -hmm. momentum finally dies out, it usually takes time. It doesn't mean you go right back down or anything like that, but you usually go back into this sideways choppiness where that was like a solid month. So, you know, we're down what, like three days in a row. It wouldn't be mm -hmm. surprising to see us not down, but just sideways for a week or two even um, as we digest the move because it was a huge move. Um, right. So yeah, just a correction for now. Okay, Very you lead me right into my next question, which is what are the key levels that you're monitoring moving forward in this market? Yeah, um, so I did SPY for this. I look at, I usually look at futures overnight for the bigger levels when the market's mm -hmm. actually open. I can watch SPY, it's, you know, they're all pretty correlated, um, but I really like the levels for the futures. But for this, I did SPY because that's what most people watch. Um, so mm -hmm. parabolic move, means you pretty much just go straight up with some sideways action and an uptrend is a pattern of higher highs and higher lows so mm -hmm. just because you go down a couple of days doesn't mean you break the uptrend to break the uptrend you got to break the recent higher low right. mm -hmm. this was such a big move that it's almost hard to gauge really what the recent higher low was so there's one that we made uh was the date 614 the low is 43350 that was just last week, but that was that low we put in wasn't even a red candle. It was just an intraday dip where we actually ended up still closing green and still moving higher. Mm -hmm. You could almost argue that's not even the real recent higher low. If you want to do a little bit more cleaner, it's uh, 42650, which is the low of June 8th. Um, and that's the real, like we broke out, went a bit sideways, and then really pushed the parabolic move. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot lower, right? We're at, I think like 434.50 now. That recent higher low of 426.50, you know, that's still whatever, like eight points lower. So mm -hmm. we could fall another five points and still be in the uptrend, still make a higher low. Mm -hmm. um, so that so that's what's tough after the parabolic move, which again, I'm not saying it's definitely done. You know, it might be done. Um, but if it is, I don't suspect that we just dive right down. But it's very unlikely that we just dive, you know, shoot right back up and make another high. Um, mm -hmm. We're more expecting now at least like a week or two of choppiness, sidewaysness, um, which eventually could equate to, oh, we actually made a higher low over that uh, 426.50. We didn't even you mm -hmm. know, break the recent higher low. But you get people chasing the parabolic move. You get people chasing, chasing, chasing. Mm -hmm. A week later, they're underwater. Then, you know, they're selling where the uptrend's still intact. And, um, you know, that's when like the real buys come in. So, um, yeah. so yeah, four, so 433.50 for momentum, 426.50 for the more real trend that we probably shouldn't break, um, mm -hmm. which gives us room lower still. It gives us mm -hmm. room to come down even more and have it you know, still be a good buy, still keep that uptrend intact. So. Mm -hmm. 2023 has been a very different market for traders than uh, 2022 or 2020, 2021 was. Um, we went through a period, as you mentioned earlier, kind of a month and a half, almost two months where we were trading in a really tight range. Then as you talked about, we had that recent really big breakout and now we're kind of just correcting off of that big breakout. How have you adjusted your trading strategy throughout these different trends we've been seeing in the market this year? Yeah, so it's been a while since we've seen a parabolic market up move. Mm -hmm. um, the last one was kind of, I want to say either March or May when we had the biggest bounce in the beginning of the bear market. And then before then, the one, the most recent one I can think of was post COVID bottom June of, it was either June or July of 2020. But it's been a while since we've had like this real kind of parabolic move. And there's names that have been leading it, Tesla has been leading it, NVIDIA has been leading it. Um, so, but, I, but I've seen them before and I know how to recognize them. So on the up, on the way up the past like two weeks or so, we were trying to ride longs saying, 
you know, this is kind of crazy, but look at the VIX. The VIX is trending down. It's not moving higher. You know, every up move is getting sold. And I've made the mistake of in the past of seeing a market get extended and shorting it, thinking it's gone too far, ignoring the fact that the VIX is just trending down and the VIX isn't giving really any clues at all. Mm -hmm. um, and what happens is it keeps grinding up and, you know, you keep getting burned and then you add a little more and you add a little more. And then when things get really crazy, that's the spot that you should be adding. But since you started too early, you can't really get involved. Mm -hmm. So instead of shorting too early, um, we're just trying to be patient and see how crazy kind of things can get, look for any divergences. And then as of last, like early middle last week, uh, we did get a bit of a VIX divergence that came in. I think we actually had one day where the VVIX, the VIX, and the market all went up together, which is like a belated <laughs> morning sign. Um, so we started to short a little bit last week looking for this parabolic move to come in. One of the things that helps me identify it is people often, I feel like, look at daily charts and not so much weekly charts. I don't look at weeklies a lot, but when the market's moving this big, you got to kind of zoom out even more and take that bigger picture. So mm -hmm. today is a good example where like if you look at a daily chart, it looks like a good area to buy. But if you look at your weekly chart, it's the same thing with the uptrend. There's still plenty of room lower to come in hmm. and still have that weekly chart look totally fine, especially on right. the QQQ. Um, so yeah, so just recognizing that we're in a parabolic max pain is up type of environment. So kind of just slowly taking the foot off the longs and then very carefully building into some kind of cute shorts lately, um, knowing that parabolic markets definitely don't last but they definitely can push more than you think they can and i'm mm -hmm. sure that's what happened lately here i'm sure like last week into last week people were thinking into 440 and we got to like 444 on like mm -hmm. the final day um so yeah so just recognizing you know what type of market right is it a range bound market is it an uptrending market we went from range bound to uptrending to parabolic now we're cooling off um, mm -hmm. And we'll see, you know, if we just spring right back up, we're still parabolic. If we lose that 433.50, the Momo is gone, but we're still in an uptrend. Um, and then, yeah, we'll see from there. So, yeah, just ex recognizing ex the environment. Explain for yourself what makes a market move parabolic. Like, what is the, what are you looking at to determine that? It's kind of an eyeball of the slope of the up move, really. So mm -hmm. typically, you know, in a black and white perfect world, you got an uptrend, like a 45 degree kind of angle, downtrend, kind of a 45 degree angle. Mm -hmm. And then usually those trends break with either you get like a rolling top where you kind of, you know, you top out and you can't quite break up and then you roll over mm -hmm. or you flag out and then keep going up, which is that's like a bull flag. Um, or you just, the trend keeps going and it goes from like 45 degrees to 60 degrees. And you can mm -hmm. kind of just eyeball the chart going in an exponential curve up, um, mm -hmm. just like purely eyeballing it kind of. And so you get, mm -hmm. you know, extension starts to be, oh, $5 extended from the ADMA is a lot. And then you start to get $10 and then you start to get $12 and it just pushes and pushes and pushes. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to look, so when that happens, then you start to look for the VIX, or at least this is what I do, you start to look for the VIX divergences in that. And towards the end, which is what we saw last week, is usually when you see, okay, the VIX is going up, the VVIX is going up, and the market is going straight up. The market's, you know, when we finally topped last Thursday, it was like a day, I'm looking at my chart now, it's a day four up, market went straight up that day, the VIX went mm -hmm. straight up with it. And the part of this whole move has been VIX keeps going down, VIX keeps going down. You have all these funds that just passively trade based on how the VIX is moving. So mm -hmm. fine, we want to keep going higher because the VIX is going down. That makes sense. Don't fight that. But then you start to see, okay, like VIX going up and market is just going straight up and is really extended on the daily. It's really, really extended on the weekly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is a bit too much, but there is no like calling the top perfectly. It's just, yeah. you know, this is getting crazy, but is it gonna top this morning, this afternoon, tomorrow, two days? That's harder to say, but you get to mm -hmm. those areas where, you know, it's clearly becomes euphoric. And there's certain gauges to watch too. 
Um, one I've been sharing in my weekly thing that I write is from CNN. It's just like mm -hmm. CNN, uh, money CNN or whatever. The fear, yeah, the greed fear index. And mm -hmm. Right. And that's like a bigger picture sentiment gauge, not so much positioning more sentiment. Um, mm -hmm. But that's hitting extreme greed in this market move. It's rare that it hits extreme levels. It's usually only once a quarter, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. So we're at extreme greed now. The last extreme reading was extreme fear for the October bottom. And then yeah. the last one before that was extreme greed, which I want to say was in some big rally um, right before that. Yeah. So you look for signs where, you know, again, it's like time frame of your trade. Am I, is this a day trade? Is it a couple day swing trade? Is it a possible, you know, multi-week, month swing trade? Um, if, you know, what are your reasons for why that's a good spot to enter? And this got to the point where, again, the daily charts were getting crazy. The weekly charts, which is even more important than the daily, was getting really, really crazy. Um, you know, this, this sentiment is getting cooked. And then you start to have, like, stocks like Nikola and you know, Carvana and, you know, Plug Power and these names that just, okay, like, the quality ran, then the Dow names ran, then the IWM ran, and it becomes like, what else is there to run? You know, let's <laughs> pick your penny stock, whatever, and mm -hmm. let's double that. And then, okay, what else is there? Um, so, yeah. What would you say for an, an, an maybe a less experienced trader than yourself is the biggest mistake they can make during these parabolic market moves, like we've been seeing? Yeah, it's just um, not... I guess not using multiple time frames on your charts, which mm -hmm. is why like now I'm emphasizing the weekly chart. And that's what got me short last week. And I missed mm -hmm. these moves before, um, especially most of the major tops and bottoms throughout this whole bear market and in general, honestly, are you get the daily extension, but you get that weekly extension for that extra edge that kind of mm -hmm. keeps you in. Um, so just rec you know where things can go is important and where things come from is important too we we went sideways for two months you know then we break out i think last week at some point we hit that 20 percent threshold off the bottom so it's yep. a new bull market like bull so market. Mm -hmm. right so you know stocks just rallied and went parabolic and now we're in a bull market and like what now is it time to buy even though, <laughs> you know, you see what NVIDIA did, you see what Tesla did lately. Mm -hmm. um, so just, you know, having patience is what you got to do. So the biggest mistake would be not having patience and, mm -hmm. you know, saying, oh, I missed that buy, I missed that buy, I missed that buy. Well, mm -hmm. like, let me just buy it here. You know, it's better to miss a trade than lose on a trade. Right. Because, um, again, then you buy too late now after this parabolic market comes in. And you might mm -hmm. get this one to two week choppiness where you're buying high and selling low and buying high and selling low and you're getting mm -hmm. chopped around. And if you're just being patient and letting it diverge and saying, all right, I missed the move. Let me wait for the next one to set up. You might actually get, you know, a good buy instead of just like chopping yourself around. Or worst case is we actually do come down. You know, the fix actually does go up for more than an hour, um, mm -hmm. which could lead to a really bigger down move because then you get all this money that's underwater all of a sudden right um, so yeah just not not having patience i would say um yeah like fo mm -hmm. fomo i guess yeah fomo it's fomo is never a good a good thing for a trader to uh yeah. to give into uh, when it comes to trading uh sentiment among kind of your big market analysts seems to be kind of split we have you know one group that says we're way overbought this market does not have room to move any more higher and then you have your other group who sees a lot of room for this market to move higher. Where do you fall on that sentiment? Who are you kind of agreeing with at this point? I would say, that's a good question. I would honestly say I'm in the middle. Oh, the worst Because, <laughs> and I hate, yeah, I mean, I hate like being always Explain in why. the middle. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, as a trader, I feel like you have to kind of always you know, be ready for anything and be ready for both ways. Because if you're 100% mm -hmm. think it's going this way and one day it's going to go the other way that you think it's going to go and you got to, you know, be able to manage that. So at the bottom in October, positioning wise, things were pretty empty and it did feel like there wasn't too much more room to go lower. But at the same time, we never really got that downside capitulation, which is what a lot of people, including myself, are waiting for. 
Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I did some buying in October, but definitely not as much as I should have. Um, um, so then you get some positioning coming in, like there's different positioning. Isn't just one area. There's different types of funds and different types of traders and all these types of strategies that people run, depending on what type of market it is. Mm -hmm. So like in October, everything's pretty empty fast forward to say like this range we're in and you got still like hedge funds are fairly short the bigger smart some of the bigger smart money is kind of getting long some of the bigger smart money is staying short retails still not really doing anything um but the vix exposure funds um whatever you want to call them ctas they have been slowly adding exposure as again the vix mm -hmm. has been more or less going straight down for like over a month mm -hmm. so now we're at the point where i feel like we are somewhat in the middle with positioning where i wonder how much more these vix exposure robots can add as again vix is like 1325 now the lowest, I mean, I'm, you know, VIX can keep going low, but the lowest mm -hmm. really this thing can go is not too much below 10. You get right. to the point there where um, before the XIV explosion happened, if anyone was trading like 2018, that was February 2018, I think. And it was just this kind of perfect environment where everything was perfect and nothing could go wrong. And XIV was a opposite VIX ETF, it doesn't exist anymore because it blew mm -hmm. up then. But everyone was just like riding it up, you know, VIX couldn't go up. And the market gets really sensitive to any VIX movements that go higher. So VIX has been going straight down. Can it keep going lower? Yes, it can. I would argue there's probably more upside room than downside room on that, but that doesn't mean it can't keep going lower. So that position, that position area, I feel like is more to the full side but the ones that have more to go are more like the hedge fund types or the people that have been really been bearish and either are short or just have been missing out on the run. And so then the second wave of like forced buying comes in. We see that a lot, mm -hmm. especially around like quarter ends and stuff like that. Right. You gotta have, you know, how did you not own any NVIDIA during this? Like you gotta buy some <laughs> NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. So then you see people buying NVIDIA all day and you're like, who is buying, you know, who is buying this up here? It just ran two weeks straight. And usually it's forced buying. They don't really care. Um, so I do, so I think, you know, like VIX products, there's some more room to go for positioning, maybe not too much, but for funds, there's definitely more room. But then after that, you, you're talking about like full positioning, you know, it's getting, mm -hmm. then it's going to get to the point where what VIX is under 12 and everything's perfect and nothing bad is going to ever happen again. And like, <laughs> You know what I mean? Which obviously you is wish. the case. So <laughs> yeah. um, that gets me a little bit nervous. Mm -hmm. But then at the same time, like the VIX exposure robots have positions on. Um, Goldman puts out a pretty good position indicator that is actually starting to get a little bit stretched to the upside. And you see mm -hmm. CNN fear greed on extreme greed. So you can't tell me there's not room to the downside and things can't sell at all when the VIX right. is just like dead and has been dead. Um, so I think there's room higher. If we go too much higher, I'm going to get pretty nervous about the VIX, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, and if there's room lower, that could just be late buyers puking because they're, you know, trapped and underwater. And then pa patient people like us come in and take advantage of that. <laughs> um, so I could see it both ways, depending on mostly how the VIX goes, honestly. All right. Um, uh, but we'll, I have a few more questions that we'll get to later, but I do want to go to our audience questions for now. And then if we hit kind of a dead spot, we'll talk more about the questions I wrote for you. But uh, our first question, and it actually goes with what you were just talking about, actually comes from Derek. And he asked, why do you pay so much attention to the VIX? Is it more important than looking at the VIX? So you've talked a lot about the VIX in our conversation here, uh, but in your weekly newsletter, you point out a lot, or you focus a lot on the VIX. So why does that why do you focus there and is it more important than the VIX in your opinion? Yeah, uh, more important maybe, I guess if I had to pick which one's more important, I would say the VIX. Um, so the VIX mm -hmm. is the volatility of volatility. 
Um, yep. Google search the exact definition, and I forget it off the top of my head, but it's measuring mm -hmm. like the future volatility. Uh, I've my friend introduced me to it like many years ago. Um, I can't remember the first time I started looking at it, but it had just been introduced to me as kind of an early signal type thing. Um, mm -hmm. And so I started paying attention to it. And more often than not, I would find that the VIX divergence, like you could not look at the VVIX, but it is a certainly early helpful tool. But usually mm -hmm. even again, like last week we had that day I think it was Thursday where the market and the VIX went up. Usually the VIX is even earlier for building that divergence, um, which I think was happening earlier last week. So not when the market topped, but like beginning of last week, you had the VIX still making lows, the market still making highs, but then the VIX was making a higher low on the daily mm -hmm. chart. So VIX is trending down, market's trending up, but then the VIX is starting to break that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why it's an early signal, I'm sure has to do with positioning in VIX futures contracts. And I, you know, off the top of my head, don't know the exact reason as to why it can be a good early, but it's just a good, it can be a good early warning signal. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we watch the VIX throughout the day as well as the VIX and the relationship between the VIX, the VIX and the market. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, simple answer, it can be an early warning signal for either way. You can also mm -hmm. see days where the market's weak and it looks like it's gonna break down and then either the VIX or the VVIX, usually the VVIX first breaks down and mm -hmm. you know the market breaks up when everyone thinks it's gonna break up, but, or I mean, sorry, everyone thinks it's gonna break down, <laughs> but then that VIX stuff breaks down and you get a bearish looking market all of a sudden breaking up and shorts getting squeezed. Um, right. So yeah. So just so for those who may not have worked with the VVIX much or focused on it much, the like official definition is that it measures the expected volatility of the 30-day forward price of the VIX. Uh, so it's just kind of an, a measure of the expected volatility of the volatility index. So like you right, were saying. Right, yeah, it's a little shorter term, right? Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, our next question comes from Buka, and he asked, so for today, what were some of the signs that will have let you determine that a lot of the tech stocks like Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, for example, will take a huge dive. For example, was it Powell's testimony that was a big sign? What other signs could one have looked at for a sudden market downturn? Or was it a um, sudden market downturn? Yeah, good question. I I don't think that it was really even the VIX today or rates or anything like that. Um, I think just if you know so like I short like Google was my best play today, which I shorted and I shorted Google simply because it was showing relative weakness over the past week or so. Mm -hmm. Google's chart has been going sideways and has been holding support and that's great, but it's been doing that as the queues make another leg higher, go parabolic, Tesla, NVIDIA. I think every, almost every single tech stock actually besides Google made a higher high, another leg up and Google didn't, it just kept going sideways. So that was my focus for if the text is going to break down and have you know a little much um, a little room lower, Google probably should get hit harder because it's been acting mm -hmm. relatively weak compared to other tech. As mm -hmm. for today being the day where tech stocks get hit, and you know, did I know that for sure at 9:29 this morning? No, mm -hmm. um, it's more just again you look at the you look at like the daily chart for the Qs. The daily ADMA is like 363 looks like we're at 362 or whatever. So there was still room. You look at the weekly chart, the weekly ADMA is at like 349. So there's mm -hmm. still 12 points lower for that weekly chart to come down and have it still be a perfectly healthy, awesome looking weekly chart. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it wasn't, it's not really for me anyway, in the way I'm playing this market right now, because it's a parabolic move. It's not so much day by day as like week by week at this point, mm -hmm. um, which isn't like the best answer for you, but it's honestly mm -hmm. just knowing that we're coming off a parabolic move and there is still room lower. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. It seems like a large part of your strategy, at least personally, is being able to zoom out and not just focus on the daily charts, but as you've talked about a lot, 
looking at those weekly charts and looking at kind of the bigger picture of where the market has room to go. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. That's, I mean, that's the big money is made in, you know, holding a lot and getting a big move and mm -hmm. you can only move so much in a day. Um, yeah. But it's much easier to get, you know, a good position at a good price and just kind of trail that versus coming in and trying to buy as much as you can every day and selling it by the close. And then the next day coming in and trying to buy as much as you can and then selling it by the close. Mm -hmm. um, so the big money's made in holding in the bigger moves. Um, yeah. And yeah, you got I mean, you got to zoom out for that. Cause otherwise, again, otherwise you, you know, you have three up days and you sell everything, but a month later, the stock is, you know, another 30% higher. And you're saying, man, if I just, you know, let it breathe and kind of zoomed out and looked at where this could possibly go. I easily could still be like easily could still be holding it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so bigger bigger picture is always most mm -hmm. important. Um, yeah. yeah. Eddie asked, uh, as a newer trader, how would you explain a process to put together all of the moving parts for a trade? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. I would mm -hmm. say. The number one, I feel like the number one thing I say to new traders is what we're talking about throughout this is just multiple time frames on your charts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I use a fair amount of indicators and whatnot, but the pick like your favorite moving average. It doesn't have to, I use the 80 EMA and the 21 EMA. It could be the 7.5 EMA or the 9 SMA, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But just pick your somewhat area this the concept of like equilibrium where the market's back and forth right it's not just straight up and you know the market just doesn't go straight up and then gap down to zero the next day um, right at least that hasn't happened yet maybe maybe it'll happen <laughs> one day um but you always get like the back and forth filling so mm -hmm. pick like that you know adma's i mean that's what we use so feel free to use that um I could use, I, that's like all I need and vol, volume is important too. Um, I could do everything I do with just that and using the multiple time frames. So where is it compared to that moving average on the five minute, the 15 minute, the 30, the daily, the weekly, all that, um, mm -hmm. and just lining all that up. And more often than not, that's it really. More often than not, like when I was newer, I would be, you know, reviewing my trades at the end of the day or whatever. And I'd be saying, oh, like, how could I have caught that? Or how could I have avoided this? And usually it was a bigger time frame, had a little bit of a different picture. And I saw one thing on the five minute, but if I looked at the 15 and the 30 or, you know, whatever the daily, I probably would have avoided it or taken something else, you know, mm -hmm. you're shorting a five minute bearish flag and you're wondering why it's not going to break down, but you're shorting it into daily support. And right. where you think it's going to break down, you probably actually should be buying mm. or, you know, a couple of days later. Would um, you say for so yeah, a new, yeah. for, sorry, for a new trader, just expanding upon this, it's, I feel like some traders can get too focused on too many things all at one time. And they're trying to look at all these different indicators. And it sounds like you would say the, the best thing to do is pick your favorite moving average and then just look at it at multiple time frames, simplify it down into that and then find your groove that way. Yeah. And then you can slowly add other edges in, mm -hmm. um, you know, as you get like more comfortable with that, but simplicity to start is better. Otherwise mm -hmm. you get analysis paralysis, as I like to say, <laughs> and yeah. you know, you're, you know, the trade is right there, but you're checking off your 20 checklist, whatever. And mm -hmm. by the time you're like figuring out if you should do it or not do it, the trade is probably gone, gone. Mm -hmm. or you probably shouldn't take it because you know, it's given you all that time and opportunity and whatnot. Um, well, and then if you have too much, like there's always going to be too much conflicting. There's always, there's always yeah. a reason to not take the trade. Um, right. You know, so you don't want to like talk yourself out. It's good to not lose money, but you can't make money not trading either. Um, mm -hmm. You, know, you got to put risk on eventually. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Our next question comes from Zach and he asked, how do you differentiate a scalp slash day trade slash multi-day move when you enter into a trade? Yeah, usually I know beforehand. Um, you, so 
a scalp usually is brought to me during the market through mm-hmm. extension or something like that some name that's running where you know it's extended on the five minute and it's been running for the past hour um mm-hmm. i'm not you know i probably should have bought it off the open but i'm not gonna chase and have fomo or anything like that but mm-hmm. if it just went straight up five dollars you know i'm thinking the next 50 cents to dollar is probably down not up and if it is up then it's even more probable that the next 50 cents to dollar is down not up mm-hmm. so that's something where like i'll work during the day and that's usually coming to me while the market's open um because right. you can't you know predict that's going to happen otherwise i'd be going yeah. off the open mm-hmm. um as opposed to like a more swing trade i'm usually you know looking at that pre-market or even days before and you know watching either a base build out or watching for extension maybe to come you know one way where i want to take the other side and if that extension doesn't come i'll miss it that's fine um or what you know whatever but it's usually predetermined um mm-hmm. and it's usually i think some you know someone once asked me like what my favorite type of trade was and i said buying quality in fear um mm-hmm. so like usually if i'm putting swings on it's usually quality it doesn't mean it's like the best company ever but you know i'm not like rock in a portfolio of a bunch of penny stocks that don't make money um you know right. if i own it i want to know what it does and if they don't make money that's fine but i want to know that and probably put less dollar risk in that type of name mm-hmm. um so yeah so the swings they're usually predetermined um based on charts and you know again you know there's only a couple ways things can bottom they can get extended down and be bottom up they can double bottom mm-hmm. they can base out and break up um but you know things don't just like gap you know, to new all-time highs and gap everywhere and, you know, this yeah. and that. Otherwise, trading would be impossible. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there are patterns. Yeah. There are patterns that exist in the market. Uh, Ryan asked, do you see any stocks that acted special during the recent market upswing and still look special now? Uh, the most special ones are probably still a little bit overcooked. So, like, Tesla was one that mm-hmm. just did not really pull back and was clearly going parabolic and then today finally actually did pull back Mm -hmm. um but one you know one down day doesn't necessarily break a trend that one definitely has room lower but it so like that's one where you know everyone wants to short tesla or whatever but that's the strongest name so it's purely technically speaking that has more room lower than like an Mm -hmm. iwm just technically speaking, but Mm -hmm. it's the strongest name. It's the favorite name. That's the one that people probably should most aggressively buy the dip in on any Mm -hmm. downside, Mm -hmm. as opposed to an IWM has more upside room, but that's the lagger. That's the weak one. You know, the makeup of it isn't as good. So that Mm -hmm. one probably actually, you know, if, you know, like we, we have right now, a cooling off market where the VIX still isn't really doing anything. So it's still pretty healthy. If Mm -hmm. the VIX actually, again, like does have a two day rally, which we haven't seen, and it's very, it's not impossible for the VIX to have a two, three day rally, things are probably going to get hit pretty hard. And that would be the scenario where, you know, we have rotation now where like IWM goes up, Q's down. That'd be more Mm -hmm. of a scenario where everything goes down. But in that scenario, Tesla would probably be getting bought more than the IWM because that's more of a, you know, it's more of a special one. It's been the, one of the strongest ones. Same thing with NVIDIA. Um, mm-hmm. You know, if you don't own NVIDIA, everyone wants to own it. So everyone's waiting yeah. for any dip to buy. Right. Um, so, yeah. So like th- those tech stocks for sure. Um, well, a couple like Tesla and NVIDIA. Um, yeah. Yeah. That kind of leads me into my next question, which is um, even with the overall action shifting more toward the downside in recent days, you know, those we've had the three days in a row of the market falling. Some individual stocks have still seen some big moves to the upside, even during this past few days of overall market going down. What stocks are you feeling bullish on right now and why? Um, Real quick before you answer. Hold on. Your camera's out of focus, so just throw your hand in front of your camera really quick and it should like re. There you go. That's better. Cool. There we go. Um, All right. (laughs) So, bullish, I would say. um, So, 
Ida, so like IWM was part of the catalyst for the second leg higher in this right. parabolic run, which really gave SPY its boost. I like IWM as a risk on risk off gauge, but hmm. I don't actually like, it's not like that good quality. The makeup of it isn't great. The makeup shifts around a lot. The top name forever was AMC mm -hmm. um, or like a sun run was really big and Penn was really big in it before. The makeup of it isn't that great. Um, mm -hmm. But the Dow is a lot more quality. Mm -hmm. So Q's went parabolic, SPY went parabolic. Dow didn't really go parabolic. It's more like mm -hmm. at resistance. Um, mm -hmm. And the IWM, if that wants to go up, that's risk on, that's great. But if I had to pick, it'd probably be more Dow themed, which doesn't yeah. necessarily mean the Dow, but for sectors like utilities, so XLU, XLP, staples, healthcare, maybe energy. Mm -hmm. um, the sentiment in oil isn't that good right now, so maybe mm -hmm. energy, but like utilities, staples, healthcare are all quality that didn't quite go parabolic so if we're still in this parabolic max pain is up environment which is very possible those would probably be the next to go um mm -hmm. i'm not you know maybe tesla goes right back up again but yeah probably those um, okay and i'm not necessarily even like bullish on them but just it's kind of figuring out all right like what can still what's quality and can still go if we still keep pushing higher Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side of that, what stocks would you say you're feeling more bearish about at this point? Yeah, so on the flip side, I'd have to say everything, but that <laughs> doesn't mean I'm bearish on everything. It just, mm -hmm. it's more, again, the VIX being so submerged and mm -hmm. can't wake up and has maybe had one green day here or there, but hasn't really had a real rally yet. And I'm not, again, like expecting Thing, a rally but i just know that it's possible and we're probably not going to go till the end of time without VIX mm -hmm. ever rallying again ever yeah. um and again it's like to that point it's like i don't want to compare it to the xiv implosion because that was like a pretty big deal but if it gets it's getting to that point where you know VIX is again past pre-covid levels it's still going down it, i think it closed on lows today um, i think the market and the vix closed on lows today which is pretty interesting mm -hmm. um so you know if we keep going and you know spy goes back up and q's hold in and the iwm runs and all these other sectors run and people add more positioning and we push extreme greed even more um then it's just going to be to the point where the vix is really sensitive and you got to be careful and a real vix up move would sell everything and then it'd be more trying to figure out what quality we want to buy in that selling that's caused by the VIX. So I'm not bearish on everything, but given where the VIX is, um, I think everything would get hit at least somewhat if the VIX rallies at all, which mm -hmm. it will eventually, but does it rally off 13 or does it rally off mid 11s? You know, I don't know, hmm. I don't crystal ball, so we'll yeah. see. Uh, our next audience question is, what's your strategy to determine the best entry point for a day trade? Uh, in parentheses, it said, sometimes the stock's low can even break lower in minutes. Uh, yeah. It, I mean, definitely depends on the trade that you're doing. Is it a with trend or counter trend trade, first mm -hmm. of all, for your day trade? If it's counter trend, I'm mostly only doing counter trend in extreme extension. So it's extended on the five, it's extended on the 15, on the 30, ideally the daily too. Um, Cause you could have intraday extension, but a daily breakout and that intraday mm -hmm. extension just gets even more extreme. Mm -hmm. um, um, so extension, if it's counter trend, and then if it's with trend, you know, look again, look at your multiple time frames. If it's with trend, the daily's probably good. The 30 minute probably isn't too bad. The 15 minute is probably tightening out and wedging out well. And then even the five minutes probably tightening out and wedging out well. Um, and so, I, I, and ideally you have a daily level that you're playing against. Mm -hmm. So don't just like buy versus the low of the day. You know, if the low of the day is off a daily support level and that's the level that should hold, then you know, 122 is the level and the low is 121.90 and it's back above 122 mm -hmm. um, and it's going back through the highs and you're uptrending on the daily, you're going with the trend. So, you know, you can buy versus that low. 
Um, mm-hmm. It could be a five minute bull flag and you know everything's uptrending. So your with trend multiple time frames are confirming and you buy versus the bottom of the bull flag or the bottom of the ignition bar on the five minute. Um, it's not like a perfect, you know, versus the low day every time or versus the last five minute candle every time. Mm-hmm. But if it's with trend, it's a definitely, it's easier to find an out because it's just clearly, you know, up higher highs and higher lows. This is where buyers took that control. There's no way that this should break lower here if this is going to keep going with the trend. Mm-hmm. Um, so sometimes it's the day low, sometimes it's yesterday's low, sometimes it's somewhere in between yesterday's low and you know halfway through yesterday. Um, you know, it depends. But is it with trend or is it against trend? If it's against trend, only extreme extension, at least for me. And then if it's with trend, um, you know, depends on your time frame. But ideally, not an ex- yeah, I guess not an extension is the main thing. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah, the opposite of okay. Everything. You've obviously talked a lot about VIX during this session today, and I would say a lot of traders I talk to say the VIX is broken. It's an indicator that they don't pay attention to because you know it goes so far down and then it gets fixed and goes back up and then it goes so far. So why do you disagree, or maybe you don't disagree? But why is it an important? Is it still an important indicator for you, even though kind of the sentiment among a lot of traders is that it doesn't matter? Yeah, I totally disagree that the VIX is broken. Okay. And I feel like I have heard that off and on since I like started trading, honestly. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like people have been saying that for years now. But right. if you look at if the VIX with the VIX, you will mm-hmm. definitely see that the VIX is not broken. Um, okay. I There's no, I don't, the VIX is like a gauge, kind of, I, you know, similar to what we say with the IWM risk on risk off, it's kind of like a gauge with that. There's yeah. no, I feel like people say it's broken because they say it should be at this level or should be at this level. And I don't really look at it like that. I just look mm. at it as if it's sideways going down or going up and if it's trending down and the market's like melting up, that's normal and makes sense. If it's, you know, going sideways and the market's stuck, that's normal and makes sense. You get big mm-hmm. spikes in the day and the market sells. That's normal and it makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, whether, I feel like when people say the VIX is broken, they're talking about, I don't know, like historical levels of where it should be. Mm-hmm. But when I look at the market, the VIX and the VIX, they all, they don't react perfectly, but um, they work the way that they're designed to work. Um, right. So yeah, I, I don't think it's broken or anything like that. Okay. It's just watching you know, how it moves, the direction, how it's moving, the direction it's moving, and the speed at which it's moving as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, levels don't really matter too much. Until yeah. again, now, now we're back to these pre-COVID levels. It's getting to that. Right. But know, that's not you saying dangerous. this number 13 is what matters so much. It's comparing. Right. Yeah. Like it's getting to this danger based on a zone, time frame. but mm-hmm. I'm not saying, oh, VIX is too low. Let me go all in short the market. Um, right but I'm definitely not going all in and buying the market now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sense. And it's important to note you're, you know, comparing to previous trends and previous times in the market right. when we saw this and what, what happened at those times. Right. right. Patterns. Patterns are so important in trading. All right. Uh, we're coming up on the end of this here. So just to wrap things up, I want you to tell me about the best trade you've had this week and what made it good. And then also the worst trade you've had this week and what made it go wrong. Uh, Best trade was probably getting short the market at the end of the last week, um, mm-hmm. just because we did a good job of finding the top, but we weren't. So like when we were finding tops or finding bottoms or whatever, I agree that you shouldn't try to buy the top and buy the bottom, but mm-hmm. I don't think it's a bad thing to try. I think when people say that, they think like all in one swoop, like this buy is the bottom or this sell is the top and I don't do it like that and we try not to do it like that we just say it's a general area sentiment whatever it may be um but there's always room for error so like Mm -hmm. again when people say like don't try to buy the bottom or buy the top I don't necessarily agree with that I just don't think you should do it all in one swoop and you probably shouldn't be you know getting over levered trying to do it either um Mm -hmm. so like Last week we were shorting, I think, again, I think it was Thursday, 
where the market screen tire and the VIX and the VVIX all went higher, that's a negative divergence sign, which ended right. up working out by the way. So the VIX, you know, another reason for the VIX not being broken. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but so I'm, um, you know, whatever level I was shorting SPY at, I think I started like over 443. I'm not shorting over 443 saying 444 is the top. I was shorting over 443 saying this could go to 447, 448 today. This could even push over, like this could get crazy. We've seen, I've seen crazy markets before and many of the people watching have as well. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I've been there, done that of trying to get too heavy too early. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting that full position, let me just get a small position. And if it works, I make a little bit. If it doesn't work right away, I get a little bit heavier and I'm down a little bit, but mm -hmm. I'll be able to, tr you know, I'm pretty confident I'll be able to trade out of it because we always see equilibrium. The market always backs and cools eventually. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so shorting the market in a fairly strategic way last week with, Again, you know, waiting for the signs, waiting for that VIX divergence to pop up, not just like shorting and riding every day, um, mm -hmm. but kind of waiting for that signal. Um, so that was good. And then my worst trade, honestly, was missing a rebuy on PayPal. Um, I definitely had some losing trades, but if I have a losing trade where I lose what I expected or less than I expected to lose in, I don't really consider that a bad trade. Um, mm -hmm. I would consider a bad trade, you know, making mistakes that, you know, you shouldn't make. So my right. worst trade was probably missing a buy back on PayPal. We had bought PayPal, I think like two weeks ago now under 60, and then I had sold it at 65 or something like that. Then I wanted to buy it low 62s, upper 61s. It went to like mid 62s. I didn't rebuy it. And then they had news yesterday. It's back up to like 69 now. So I missed the second leg up in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know for whatever reason took my focus off it no excuses um but i missed that so missing you know i don't want to like miss trades and all that but i would consider that my worst trade as opposed to like taking a small loss on a yeah. short here or there or whatever um because i probably should have caught that um yeah i should have caught yeah. that so mm -hmm. that's the yeah worst okay one. But there's always more to come always yeah. so and that's the thing with like the new traders and the fomo like if just the market's all you know until again the end of time like the market's going to move it's open um there's always more opportunities so right you, know, you don't have to you know hate yourself forever because you didn't buy all in nvidia in october like it's fine there's going to be more big movements out there um so yeah. just wait for the next one and get the next one with whatever name it's in whatever way it's going it doesn't really matter just Wait for that setup and then yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, Patrick, this was a great discussion. We had a you know great audience questions and uh, I learned a bunch this week from you. So that was great for for everyone, I think. So thank you so much for joining me. Uh, right now for the audience, I am putting a link in the comments for next week's event. And uh, next week we'll have a new guest with us, Andrew Moss, who is a professional registered trader with T3 Trading Group and also a chartered market technician. Uh, so he, uh, if you follow him on LinkedIn or Twitter, uh, he posts a lot of charts and he knows what he's talking about when it comes to charts. So I think we'll have a great discussion yes, he then. He's a good guy for sure. Yeah. Uh, Patrick knows him uh, since he trades with trading group. Uh, so uh, he will be here next week at 4.30 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday, June 28th. Uh, so you can sign up at that link I just put in the comments. And thank you again, Patrick, for joining me. We'll have Pat, Agon Pat on again in the future as well. Thanks. Thank you.